Hello and welcome to Nailing Your Next OpenStack Job Interview. Your presenters today are Brad Picorni, who is a principal software engineer at Symantec, and for the past few years he's been focusing on Horizon. I am Tim Symanczyk, uh, also a principal software engineer at Symantec, and for the past few months I've been focused on Glance. So what we're going to cover is what the current hiring situation is, how to get yourself noticed, uh, typical interviews, things specific to ops interviews, things specific to dev interviews, and finally, we'll try to give you some tips to help you make the right decision once you actually have the offer. So what is the current hiring situation? At least for the US, here's uh, the unemployment stats for the IT industry straight from the Department of Labor Statistics. You can see in 2002 that when the first tech bubble popped, you can see around uh, 2010, I guess that's the financial crisis. But right now, we're not doing too bad. It's been better, it's been worse. But if you work for a big company or you know someone who works for a big company, then you know that the layoffs never stop. And the best time to find a new job is when you already have a job. And there's two reasons for that. One, it gives you the luxury of time so that you can really find a good fit and make the right decision. And two, it gets you a much stronger negotiation uh, position if you're already employed. Now to speak specifically about OpenStack, I'll turn it over to Brad. Just this thing. Thanks, Tim. So how has hiring changed for OpenStack jobs over the years? As most of you know, OpenStack is a fairly new technology. And uh, until about 2014, those were great years. There was lots of expansion in OpenStack. Companies were sending new hires directly to Paris when they started. And if you could spell DevStack, you could have a job. Now, after about 2014, things have tightened up a little more. In the end, everyone is trying to make money off of OpenStack. And so there's more of a focus right now on contributing to OpenStack only if the company gets something out of it, or only if it makes financial sense. And so that's the bad news, but OpenStack knowledge is still highly in demand. So next, let's talk about how to get noticed in the first place. And I'll cover the obvious stuff first. So you've all probably, you know these websites. You know how to use them. I won't waste your time with them. But if you're not using them, get on them. And they're a, a valuable part of a job search. And particularly in the world of open source, there are great opportunities for showcasing your work around the world while you're doing your day job. Everything is done out in the open. So lots of people outside your current company can see what you're doing. And specific to developers, if your primary job is upstream development, you should be doing reviews regularly. And this is because the hiring managers and the people who know how Open, OpenStack community works know that the upstream developers who really get things done are doing lots of quality reviews. And so that makes things move along a lot faster for them. So notice I put code commits secondary on this list. Always important, but still not as important as reviews. And even if you're a developer who's just developing code internally, so your code is not out in the open in public, still public documentation and blogs about what you've done are very helpful. And then, of course, being a core or a PTL comes with the recognition that you know what you're doing. So for operators, the situation is nearly the same. The various upstream automation projects like Puppet, Chef, and Ansible all need ongoing contributions to stay up to date as OpenStack evolves. And so those are a good way to contribute as an operator. And blog posts on common operational techniques are very useful, particularly in the areas where there are common operational problems that need preventing. So issues with Rabbit, uh, preventing file systems from filling up, maintaining LDAP and security. And the need for operators to review code and docs is also high. As you know, there are lots of developers pushing code into OpenStack. And many times, they're breaking stuff that operators depend on. And so if you're an operator who's doing good reviews on code, 
and preventing those issues from getting merged into the code base, that's going to be noticed, and that's highly useful. It's also good to keep in mind what companies need and what's most valuable at the moment. So most corporations using OpenStack are either selling it as vendors or they're running it internally as operators. And so for those that are vendors, they need people who can contribute to the product. For example, IBM sells the whole hardware software stack, including OpenStack, to run in a customer environment. And so they're looking for people who need engineers to write any new features upstream that they're going to need for the product. Then on the operator side, lots of companies need help building and operating clouds. So it's very common that I'll be talking to someone in the tech industry, and even though they don't work on something specific to OpenStack, they'll mention that they, they use OpenStack internally for some environment. So small companies, medium companies, at every level, people are using OpenStack for these various environments, and all those environments need ongoing maintenance. Hybrid cloud is also very big lately, and this means different things to different people, but it's either about running OpenStack as a public and a private cloud and connecting those together, or about connecting OpenStack to other public cloud providers. Not many companies just run only OpenStack, and it's, it's much more common that they use OpenStack for some environments, and then AWS or some other public cloud provider uh, for other environments. And in those situations, there are both development and operations jobs for connecting those clouds together in seamless ways. For example, even Rackspace at this point is in the AWS game while they're still working on OpenStack as well. And so next I'd like to do a little activity. And please put your hands up if you got your last job by applying specifically to that job on a website. So just a few out there. And what I've found in my career is that the probability of getting a good job by applying to some public job posting is almost zero. We've all done this before, applying to specific job postings, but they almost never work out. And despite all the job finding technology we have, so LinkedIn and Monster and applying on websites, personal connections are still your best bet for getting in the door. When you apply on a website, your resume goes to some recruiter, then on to HR, and then if it passes the automated screens, then on to a hiring manager. But with a personal connection, your resume often goes straight to the hiring manager, and then you get that added benefit of the person recommending you as well. So next, let's go over some typical interviews. And in the tech industry, the interview processes can vary widely between companies. And so at one end of the spectrum is the short interview process. With these, it's maybe one to two interviews before they make a hire or no hire decision. In these, your previous work is often a very big deal. They don't have a lot of time to get to know you. And so they're looking at what you've done in the past to know if they're a good fit for them right now. So if you're a core reviewer, this might be very easy for you to get a job in this situation since they're looking at your work from the past. And in this case, maybe only one or two people you need to convince to hire you. Then on the other end of the spectrum is the marathon interviews. And what comes to mind these days is the FANG companies, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And with these, you'll have an HR interview, possibly multiple tech screens, and then four to six in-person interviews the same day. So in this case, what you've done in the past is relatively unimportant. They have a lot of time to get to know you, and they'll figure out what you're capable of during that interview on the day. So one way they do this is by coding on the whiteboard. And this is even for operations, oftentimes. So even for operators, they might have you writing puppet code directly on the whiteboard. Cores get the same coding tests as everyone else, so it's not such a leg up in that case. And they often have separate design and behavioral interviews. In this case, it's maybe four to six people you need to convince to hire you, so a lot more demanding. And in this case, uh, they have sort of revolving door interviews where if you're, if you're just a maybe at the end of the process, they'll probably say no to you. But the good thing is that 
since these companies know that, even if you get rejected in one interview, um, they'll often have you reapply in a year or in a few months and they'll try again. So often very easy to get uh, second or third interviews with these companies. And if you get an interview and you don't know what to expect from that specific company, Glassdoor is a good place to check for it. People go and post actual interview questions that they've had asked of them for these specific companies. Also, if you're working with an external recruiter, they'll often tell you lots of info about what to expect in the interview. The external recruiters are almost never paid unless you get hired. So it's in their best interest to get you hired, and they'll often tell you probably more than they should about what to expect in the interview process. So let's get into some specifics about ops interviews. And we'll do a little hands-on exercise first. So since we're talking about OpenStack, uh, if you have pen and paper, then you can write down what you think on this one. Um, or otherwise, just think about how you would answer this in an interview situation. So what happens in OpenStack when you boot a VM from the OpenStack CLI? And think about the components that get involved, the order those components are invoked in, the non-OpenStack components that get involved, and communication protocols used between them. And I'll give you about 30 seconds to think about this before I move on. Okay, so how many did you get? About 10 or 15? Here's a possible list. And when I ask this interview question, these are some of the things I look for. Uh, one of the things people often forget is getting the Keystone token, especially when we're talking about Nova calls. People forget that you need that Keystone token, a very important part of the flow. And then I won't go over all these, but uh, a lot of things happen in Nova, of course. Uh, you can take a look at these after the presentation. And then eventually, Nova Compute uses libvirt on the hypervisor to boot the instance. And so then we get outside of OpenStack. Um, and that's, uh, again, part of the process, but something that, uh, that you should be familiar with. And the idea here is not to get all the right answers, but just to be able to take someone through what happens from end to end and um, uh, to to think about it systematically through the whole process. Here's another one that I've asked people during interviews. And here we've got a screenshot of Horizon. And in this case, there are two instances that have been booted. And when those instances were booted, they must have had some image that they were booted with. But now, the image name is blank when we look at them. So what are some of the situations where that image name could be blank? And this is a good one to see how a person solves a problem they might not already know the answer to. So you might not have seen this exact scenario before, but if you know enough about OpenStack, you can probably reason through some of the things that could have happened. So some possibilities, maybe the, the policies changed. So if they booted the instance, and then the glance policy was changed, this user may no longer have access to that image, but their instance is still running. If the image was deleted, so again, they, they booted the instance, but image is deleted, instance is still running, but the, there's, there's no longer an image name to display. Or if the image was public and has now been made private, so they, they had access to it, and again, no longer have access at this point. And for ops interviews, you're likely to get some automation and design problems as well. So maybe very specific things, like write an Ansible playbook to install and configure Horizon. And with this one, they're probably not looking for you to know the exact package names to install. But they probably are looking for you to write 
uh, syntactically correct playbooks in this case and show that you can do that off the bat. Maybe more general things, like what's the best automation technology to use for OpenStack? So you might answer Puppet, Chef, or Ansible and explain why. But better yet to explain why some of those are better in some situations and then others are better in other situations. And sort of an operations design problem, given budget constraints and business requirements, how would you allocate resources between the various OpenStack components? So this one requires you to, uh, to know enough about OpenStack to justify why you would make the trade-offs between different components. So some critical skills for operators. Familiarity with at least the Big Tent OpenStack projects. Familiarity with how to maintain RabbitMQ, Cupid, maybe other queuing systems. Uh, you always have a queuing system with OpenStack and always very important to maintain. Linux system administration. Almost all OpenStack installations are run on top of Linux and so very important to be able to maintain those systems at least some basic networking knowledge. For example, how many usable IPs are there in a slash 28 network? So you might not have the answer memorized, but to be able to, to reason through how you would calculate what's left. And of course, if you're an, a networking ops person, you'll need very detailed networking knowledge, but at least basic networking for everyone. Certificate management. So. Again, in all OpenStack environments, you need to secure the connections between the components. And so managing certificates in that environment is very important. Uh, and one thing I've been asked in terms of certificate management in an interview is why do you sometimes see invalid certificate errors when you go to websites? So they're looking for if the certificate has expired, if it's a self-signed certificate and you don't have the, uh, the signer in your key store, but some indication that you know how certificates work and also what their failure modes are. So why do you sometimes see errors about them? And next I'll turn it back to Tim for dev interviews. Thank you, Brad. So we've already covered a little bit how important the reviews and the commits are, but just to highlight it, literally, uh, Whatever your current job, you may have uh, obligations to do some number of review, uh, reviews per period, some number of commits per period. You always have to keep in mind that everything you're doing is going to be in public forever. Your next potential company is going to see this. So I know uh, nobody here, obviously, but some people enjoy gaming Stackalytics with just drive-by plus ones. And your next potential boss is going to be able to see this, and that's a bad red flag. Similarly with uh, commits, if every, if uh, flipping through your history, the only thing we see is uh, every few months you play with the white space a little bit, that's a horrible sign. Uh, but the positive signs, you're completing blueprints, you're filing, resolving bugs, or of course if you're a core reviewer. And uh, there's actually a lot of resources out there. Here's uh, uh, three books that we enjoyed. A lot of it is information that we're covering right now, but the reason to still pick those up if you're interested is they have a lot of example coding questions and not just the questions and not just the answers, also a reasonable way on how to, on how you would come to this conclusion on your own in an interview situation. Uh, similarly, sites like HackerRank or LeakCode uh, many good examples of programming questions and the, the more questions you see, the goal isn't to just memorize the uh, question and spew back the answer, The more, because uh, you're never going to get the exact same question in a live interview situation, but if you've seen enough questions, then you're going to already know how a similar problem was solved and it's going to give you a leg up. Uh, usually, usually, it's good to confirm this, but the interviewer wants to see what you really do in your language of choice. So for example, presumably most people here are Python developers. It's great to apply for a Java job, but don't make the mistake of suddenly trying to pick up a new language and cram, 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 because I don't care how smart you are. 
the code that you're going to demonstrate, put on the whiteboard after a few days of a crash course in Java is not going to be of the same quality. So with no shame at all, happily show them, uh, show them the Python code and show them what you can really do. And uh, this is important, do not use pseudocode. It, uh, it's a horrible red flag. If, if you're trying to sell yourself as an experienced, accomplished developer and you can't put up some kind of syntactically plausible Python, that's a red flag. Uh, especially for a lot of indi uh, individual interviewers, this is going to be the only code of yours that they'll see. Not everybody's going to go digging through your commit history. So make sure it's as close to production quality as possible. Catch the error cases. Like if you're writing a function uh, that opens a file, make sure you're catching the error. And even better, differentiate between why did the file open fail? Did the file, does the file no longer exist or is the file already locked? This is little niceties like that are the difference between an okay interview and a great interview. So how did we get here with all the, the whiteboard coding? If you've been around the industry long enough, you remember that it wasn't always like this. It used to be uh, more like any other job interview where you'd talk about what you did and talk about what the new job would entail. But uh, I guess 15 or 10 years ago or so, uh, Bill Gates decided that this is the one true way to interview developers. And ever since then, most people have picked it up. So what's interesting is it's not clear that being great at whiteboard coding is directly related to being great at real world coding, which is unfortunate, especially if you don't like these style of interviews. But the fact is that uh, this is the way our industry is and we all have to deal with it. So one of the biggest mistakes, I see this all the time, whiteboard coding and keyboard coding are not the same. And it's whiteboard coding is a skill you need to practice it, even if you spend eight hours a day, every day coding on the keyboard before the interview. Really try to put yourself in, the, in a practice whiteboard situation. Go to a site like HackerRank and do the problems. Most interviews are 45 minutes to an hour, so give yourself that artificial time limit. Don't use your IDE, it's so easy to forget how much IDEs these days can help you out. So use the bare bones interface and maybe pick a question that doesn't seem like fun to you. Because in a real interview situation, you don't get to say, oh, I, I don't like that question, let's do something else. Uh, people have tried and it's a bad red flag. Uh, so speaking of that, keyboard coding obviously is also a skill and especially as you progress with your career, often you, the further you get, the less coding you do sometimes. Maybe you're managing people, maybe you're managing projects, you have other worries, and it's so easy to just have this pin in your mind of, well, of course you're a great software coder. Well, you were two years ago, and now you're forgotten, and now it's rusty, so don't just remember how good you used to be. Practice ahead of time. And uh, this is actually one of the answers I've gotten from uh, one of the people who was unfortunately rustier than they thought. I asked them a very simple coding question and they came back with, oh, that's so easy, I'd make an intern do it. And unsurprisingly, once you, you poke a little bit, it turns out that he hadn't actually touched a keyboard in five or so years. So here's an example of an easy question. Uh, write a function that takes a string as input, returns the string reversed. Now, very, very often with the simpler questions, you can do it in one line, especially if you know the library well. And I think there's, uh, in Python, there's a reverse function. And it's great to know that, but the thing is, interviews aren't trivia questions. It, isn't, it doesn't teach the interviewer anything, the fact that you happen to know that the reverse function exists. So don't be surprised and certainly go along with it when the interviewer asks you to do it the hard way, to write out the code, because that's what they want to see. And when you're testing your code, 
uh, make sure each one of your test cases actually adds something. For example, uh, if your function takes in an integer, have the positive integer, have the negative integer, have zero, have not a number, but don't just add a bunch of numbers to say, hey, look how great my test coverage is, because automated testing, it is cheap, but it's not free. You know that uh, when you do an upstream commit, it can take an hour or two for Garrett to come back to you, and some of that is useless test bloat that the individual tests, they're, 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 rep uh, they're rep uh, repetitious. So here's an example of a, a more difficult question. And you should never worry. You're, very, very often, the interviewers are going to collude to make sure they, uh, they eventually stump you. It's not interesting. They don't learn anything about you if it's just easy question, easy question, easy question. So you are going to get a question that uh, you can't do immediately, and that was on purpose. Uh, so that, um, a good way, I'm sorry, I'm very jet lagged. A good way to proceed is just start by saying, oh, here's the, the brute force solution, and further explain why you wouldn't use the brute force solution. So doing something like that is much better than standing at the whiteboard uh, in silence. Uh, one way, it gives the opportunity, it gives the interviewer the opportunity to actually interact with you, see how you would be to work with, and it also opens a window to let the interviewer steer the interview. So start out with brute, uh, brute force solution, obviously we wouldn't do it that way. Then start to think about uh, what data structures might be useful, what algorithms you know, and have that conversation. Think out loud. And a key point, make sure you're listening to what the interviewer actually uh, is trying to tell you. When you're up there, you're in the middle of writing, you have a train of thought, they know that. They know that interrupting you is going to derail your train of thought a little bit. So they're not gonna do it for no reason. If they point out, are you sure about that? Are you sure you wanna do it that way? If you fix it or uh, you change your plan or you don't, that's your choice. Just make sure that you hear what they're actually telling you. And finally, here's an example of a time complexity question. What's the running time to find a value in a binary search tree? Uh, well, please don't say log n, because it depends on are we talking about a balanced binary search tree, and are we talking about the average runtime or the worst case runtime? I don't like the term trick question. This is sort of a trick question, but there's no negativity here. The point is to see are you going to spot that ambiguity are you going to ask for clarifications? Because again, they want to see how you're going to be to work with. And if you're a type of person who just jumped straight into, oh, it's log in, maybe they don't want to be your coworker. Uh, and now that you've passed all your interviews, I'd like to pass it back to Brad to talk about how to uh, make the right decision. And as far as making the right decision once you get an offer. There are tons of resources out there. So you can search Google and uh, read books about how to know the company is a good fit for you and how to negotiate your salary and things like that. So I don't want to waste your time with all the general stuff that you can just go and search online for yourself. But for some specific things to OpenStack, telltale signs that an OpenStack job is a bad fit for you. If they're using OpenStack in production, but they haven't automated anything, then either when you come in, you're going to be doing the automation, and maybe that's what you like to do, and that's fine. Um, but otherwise, if they haven't automated anything and they don't plan to, they're probably fighting fires all the time in that production environment right now. And when you join, you're going to be fighting those fires with them. I mean, it's, it's just not going to be a fun job. If OpenStack is critical, critical to their future, but they're laying off OpenStack people. And we all know companies that have done this, and it's still going on right now. Um, it's unfortunate, and it's never a good situation, either for the people who are still there or the people who are hiring in. 
So it's just not a good situation. If you want to do upstream development, but they only talk about operations during the interview, then when you get there, you're probably going to do operation stuff with them and not doing the upstream development that you want to. And also, if the hiring manager can't answer detailed questions about their OpenStack environment. And you have to be careful how you find this stuff out. So when you're asking these detailed things, so you don't sound like a jerk in the interview. But if they can't answer these things, then either the hiring manager is just non-technical, or they really don't know what's going on in that environment. And either way, it's just going to be a, a bad situation for everyone involved. So we've gone through this whole process of how to get noticed for OpenStack jobs, how to get interviews, what to expect during interviews, and then how to make decisions at the end. And so now you're ready to go and get your dream job. Thank you. And we have some time, so if you, if you have a question, please come up to the mic and ask there. Uh, I see one trend in OpenStack is like, so far core components were getting developed, but now most of the things are moving towards container. The development is moving toward container. So, and I see it's a very dynamic environment because two, three years back I saw everything was a beginning in OpenStack and now it's everything is mature. So how we should adapt with the community, like what we can do so that we can remain relevant in the market? Yeah, good question. And so this is, it's a challenge just in the tech industry in general, just to stay up to date with what's going on. And particularly for OpenStack at this point, I mentioned a little, uh, a few slides back, hybrid cloud. So everybody's talking about hybrid cloud and how do we hook these things up right now. And there's a lot of development uh, to, to hook things together and make sure we automate things between those clouds. Um, but then also operations to set the things up in the first place. And so hybrid cloud is one thing. And then, of course, development that's around containers is a big thing as well. Um, but as, as people of the tech industry, that's something that we've kind of signed up for, to, that we constantly have to be learning and staying up to date with, with new things that are going on. Good question. Uh, so the question was uh, to repeat it. So if if your day job is not exactly the latest thing with OpenStack, uh, how do you handle that? And um, one thing would be uh, if if your company is just doing kind of old things that um, that aren't the the leading edge thing, you're pretty much stuck with just learning those on your own and maybe. Um, building your own environment and writing blog posts about it or something like that to show that you know it. Um, but to to actually work with it and work out the details on your own is extremely important. Um, but otherwise, if, if there are other teams at the company who are doing that more cutting edge stuff and, and you want to get into that, to really push your manager to get you into there. Um, so those are some things that, that might help in that case. Do a shameless plug uh, in case somebody's looking for an OpenStack job working upstream. Look me up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what company? Lenovo. Lenovo. Yeah. Lenovo. All right. If there's no more questions, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.